grateful and thankful that the Lord talents people like this so that we can think more of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, these folks love the Lord. It's very, very obvious. And they come from a wonderful families and a great church. I'm grateful for the Clark family. It's good, good to get to know them this week. And if you've enjoyed them, say amen. 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 Let's get it, Brother Dean Miller. Race one up here, Brother Dean. He's ready to roll. This guy right here is my friend. Can any good thing come out of Mississippi? <laughs> He can even spell Mississippi. I'm going to tell you what, he's one of the smartest people down there. And uh, he's been pastoring the Central Baptist Church now for just about 10 years. And he has a wonderful ministry there. Wonderful. It's the most human place I've ever been in my life. But it's a wonderful, wonderful church. Great people. They've been doing some remodeling and enlarging down there. And, and the Lord has a special touch on this man. I'm glad he's my friend. And he has a wonderful wife and family, three girls. This guy lives, he breathes hairspray. Yeah. And uh, I think he sets and perms that hair, to be honest with you. I'll tell you what, I don't like to have my hair messed up, but I promise you this cat don't like that either. <laughs> <laughs> Pray for him. He's, uh, he's in mourning, he and his wife. They've been grieving. Their daughter went to college. And so tonight he's preaching on heavy medication, yeah. antidepressants. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love this guy. I love his family. Let's give him a good Franklin Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Well, amen. And I want to say Brother Norris is my friend, and I'm honored uh, to call him my friend. He has been such a help to me. Uh, when I first got to Hattiesburg, I grew up in a preacher's home, and uh, my, my daddy pastored the same church 35 years. I, we started that church when I was two years old. And I left there when I was 26 years old. And, um, and so I'd been with him all those years and grew up in a preacher's home, worked on staff. But when I became a pastor, um, there used to be an old Western store in Colorado that we used to go to all the time, buy cowboy boots and uh, blue jeans. And in that Western store, there used to be a picture in there. And the picture was a pair of cowboy boots. And in those cowboy boots was a little baby with nothing on from the back, from the back view. And um, the sign said something about, uh, he may not look it, but he feels important. <laughs> and that's how I felt, pastor in the church. I felt like a little baby in these big boots. And, uh, and I, I remember being overwhelmed, and um, uh, the Lord had just put some people on my heart, and your preacher was one of them. I had never met him before. I, I had never, I'd never uh, been in a service where he preached, uh, but I picked up the phone, and I called Brother Norris, and I said, would you give me some counsel? And so gracious, so helpful, so kind, he gave me some counsel. Here's what he said. Resign. No, he didn't. <laughs> he, didn't. he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that. But I wished he would have said that. Uh, he didn't say that. But he was so gracious, and he helped me with a schedule. He helped me get some things on the ground and uh, just kept my eyes focused on the Lord. And uh, what a joy. And his family has just been a blessing to, to me and to our family. He, and he just loved my girls, and he's, he's been a blessing. I told my girls, I sat them down. When my oldest daughter became a teenager... I sat her down and I said, now, Deanna, you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be a teenage girl now. And I said, there's going to be a lot of things that come across your life and in your mind and in your heart. And I said, the devil's going to try to divide you from your mom and daddy. He's going to try to attack you in all kinds of ways. And I said, you need a good counselor. You need somebody that you can go to that will give you the word of God, that will help you. And sometimes uh, you need a pastor. And sometimes you may just see daddy as your daddy and not as your pastor. And I said, so if you want to call a pastor, I said, uh, who would you like to call? And she said, Brother Norris. And I said, well, listen, if you ever need to call a pastor and you need to talk to somebody, you call him. And uh, he's just held my girl's confidence. And I, I thank the Lord for that. That's a treasure. And uh, I appreciate that so much. And uh, just a joy to be in this place. And I'm excited about being in the tent. Man, this is great. Uh, I could feel the excitement coming in. I parked the car. Man, I was ready to go. I just was surprised someone's not going in the back, just hollering, peanuts, popcorn here, <laughs> peanuts, popcorn here. But uh, looking, forward to, looking forward to some, I think we're having some snacks later or something. I don't know. But we'll, uh, we'll is it popcorn? Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
Oh, popcorn's a wonderful thing, you know? Tell you get one of those little kernels spot welded on the back of your tongue, then you're in trouble, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but uh, this has been a joy. And it's good to see Brother Clark and his family. Um, I've only been with him one other time, and he couldn't remember where it was, but I could never forget it. <laughs> he said, where have, we, where have we been together? And I said, it was Brother Pinachetti's. Now, that doesn't mean anything to you. But, brother, that's a mouthful, is it not? I went to Brother Pinachetti's. Brother Pinachetti is a pastor in Philadelphia. And he calls me up and said, Dino! <laughs> brother, he said, I want you to come to Philadelphia. And he said, I want you to preach my 30, was it 35? 35th year anniversary. Now, if you've never, you don't know Brother Pinachetti, perhaps, but listen, you've never met anybody like this guy. His church has just been there for 35 years, right down in the inner city of Philadelphia, pastoring a church, winning people to Christ, beating people up. I mean, just, I mean, he is a gangster. He is, he, is, he is everything that is quintessential to Philadelphia. That is Brother Pinachetti. And, uh, and his church, he'll get his church up to a certain size, and he'll have a good man on his staff. He'll be working with his people, and he'll say, all right, now brother's going to go over here, and he's going to start a church on the other side of Philadelphia. He said, if you want to go with him, you stand up right now. So they'll stand up, and he's like, you know, no, you can't. you got marriage problems. Sit down. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. He said, the, man, the man's going to start a church, man. He don't need to be counseling you and your wife. You're still beating each other. Sit down. <laughs> he, said, he said, Jerry, why are you standing up? You don't even tithe. Sit down. You can't have a man build a church if you ain't tithing. Sit down. So he'll get like five or six, seven, eight families, whatever it is, that are people that are soul winners, sold out, no marriage problems, tithe. They say, all right, now you guys go over there. We'll get you a building and start a church. I mean, he'll just empty his church out, and then he'll just grow right back up, and you get another man going, and they're starting church all over. We're driving through Philadelphia, and now he's driving through Philadelphia pointing out stuff. I'm in Philadelphia, like holding on to the side of the door. He's just jumping, yeah, we started that church over there. We just bought that building right there. I mean, it's just absolute craziness. I've got my oldest daughter with me. We go to Philadelphia. I've never been there in my life. So I'm thinking, this is going to be great. We're going to go down and see Liberty Square. We're going to see, the, we're going to see Independence Hall. Where the, where the, man, this is where it all took place. This is where the Constitution was drafted and the Declaration of, or the Declaration of Independence was, was drafted and signed. And this, we're going to go see the Liberty Bell. We're going to, man, this is going to be great. We're going to eat a cheesesteak. So we're walking around like tourists, you know, taking pictures and just having, we have no idea where we are. But we're in Philadelphia, a.k.a. Philadelphia. <laughs> so Sunday comes, and man, I go to church, and I'm preaching there, and, and uh, I, I get up to preach. And, and this is crazy. They got all these permits because they're right downtown. I mean, their church, if you've ever seen pictures of Philadelphia and all the row housing, you know, there's just a house here, and then a house here, and then a house here, and a house here. Their church is like in those row housing. They bought, some time ago, bought this row house, and they just knock walls out and begin to just build other things. And you, so, so it looks like it's just in the neighborhood, but it, when you get in there, and there's a church in there. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And so they got permits. They, lock, they block the street in front of the church, and they bring all these inflatable things out there. They got, they got, like, they got a buck and bull. You've never lived until you see a bunch of inner-city Philadelphia people try to ride a buck and bull, one of those mechanical bulls. They had pony rides. Half those kids had never even seen a pony. The way the pony ride went, we're on this little tiny inner city street. I'm talking like two cars cannot pass each other without scraping paint. And they got all this stuff set up, and they got pony rides. The guy gets the pony out, and he's got the pony on the sidewalk, and he tells his kid, get on. And the kid gets on. And that's just how they talk to each other. Get on. The kid gets on. This other kid's like, I want to ride the donkey. You, you, you wait your turn. So the guy just walks the donkey like 15 feet and then backs it up. <laughs> Get off. Get on. <laughs> Walk the donkey. This donkey, like literally, if you were to ever like turn it loose in a pasture, all that donkey would do is like he would walk. <laughs> You'd have to put his water there and his food there. He'd just back up to I'm looking at that donkey. I'm looking at these kids. I mean, I've, I've never seen anything like this. We're eating in the middle of the street. It's just unbelievable. People coming by. Hey, Blake, Blake, you got the street blocked. What's wrong with you? I'm going to shoot you. You know, Brother Pinochet is like, shut up. Come to church next Sunday. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll be there. Okay. I'm standing there going, Deanna, we're not in Mississippi anymore. 
I'm telling you, this is the truth. This is the honest truth. I'm standing there. All these activities are going on. This lady walks with me. She's just bawling. She's like, man, I'm so glad I came today. My daddy was in this church. He helped build this church 35 years ago. I was a little baby. Then I got away from God. I married the wrong man. I got out in sin. I was almost jumped off a bridge and committed suicide. This lady's just telling me all this. The postman grabbed me by my ankles and pulled me back over. It was a miracle. She said, and I just knew something special was going to happen today, and I, I said, I'm going to come. My husband's like, you ain't going to church. She said, I'm going to church. He said, you ain't going to church. We got in a big fight, so I stabbed him. <laughs> and then I got in the car, and the car was low on gas, and I just prayed God help me get there, and he answered my prayer. Isn't that great? I'm like, can we circle back around to the point where you stabbed him? <laughs> Let's talk about that for a minute. She said, yeah, I stuck him. I said, you, literally, you stabbed me. Oh, yeah, he's bleeding. <laughs> See, but God worked in my heart. This is great. I'm going to get back right with the Lord, and this is wonderful. I said, yeah, but you committed a crime. <laughs> See, ah, it's all right. I went over to Brother Pinochetti. I'm like, hey, man, listen, I, you know, I don't want to meddle in anybody's business here, but mm, that lady over there, the crazy one, they're all crazy. What are you talking about? I said, that lady over there, she stabbed her husband. He said, who? Which one? I said, that lady right there. I said, she stabbed her husband. She just told me. She said, oh, yeah, Gina, pff, ain't the first time, won't be the last. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So we go back into church, and I preach the second service in the church. Man, the Lord moved. We had a great time. Well, then that night, I preach Sunday morning, then I preach Sunday afternoon, and then I'm dry, and then Brother Pinachetti's going to take me over to another church that started over in what they call Kensington Heights, okay? So he's taking me over there Sunday night. So I get up and I say, hey, listen, you know, y'all you know, pray for us. We're going over to Kensington Heights. And the whole church is like, oh. <laughs> like what? I'm like, oh, nothing. <laughs> so after the service, they're like walking up like, God bless you. We're going to pray for you when you go to Kensington Heights. You be careful. It's really bad over there. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> People have been stabbed here today and you people are telling me to be careful over there because those people over there are crazy this is nuts it was unbelievable i've never been that's a true story that is a true story and then and then brother clark comes and sings that night i'm like i'm like i have never in my life been anywhere like that i could not wait to get out of philadelphia <laughs> i got back to mississippi i just kind of was just walking around like this for a little while i just said somebody say y'all and give me some sweet tea right now <laughs> Y'all, sweet tea, fry something, I'll eat it, but I got it. So I got a glass of sweet tea, I got a fried Twinkie, and I calm right down. That's where we need to be. That old ticker was moving a little too fast. Since I moved to Mississippi, you know, I've been eating all this fried food, and I can actually hear my heartbeat. It's like... <laughs> it's so humid down there, when I sweat, I sweat gravy. People in my church think gravy is a beverage. There's gravy on everything. Oh, man, I got some Fruity Pebbles. Yeah, put some gravy on it, preacher. Man, that'd make it real good. And then just chase it down with some sweet tea. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I don't know what the deal is in, my, in Mississippi, but everybody does like this. You know? Like, man, I'll tell you what. I was sitting up there in my deer stand. And this buck came through, he was getting it. You know what I mean? He was just getting it. <laughs> and like, even the ladies, like, whoo, man, preacher, we almost didn't make it. And Mike was over there in the driver's seat, he was just getting it on the way down here tonight. I'm looking like, what are y'all shooting at? I don't know. <laughs> but I'd much rather them be doing that than stabbing people, you know? <laughs> I can't even imagine one of Brother Pinachetti's counseling services. You know, yeah, what can I do for you? Yeah, she stabbed me. No, you stabbed me. You, just, <laughs> you know? Unbelievable, but that's where we made it. Good to see you, Brother Clark, and uh, your family. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we've patted him down. Metal detectors, you know. But uh, it's been good. Isn't it good to be here? Amen. You know, with all that's going on in the world, isn't it great to be saved? Amen. I'm more thankful today that I'm saved and uh, that the Lord uh, has, has saved me. Because I'll tell you right now, this world is crazy. 
And to come in here and just get some sanity and to see, uh, to see those of us. Listen, listen, I'm telling you right now, it is wonderful to be living at the end of the story in Mark chapter 5 when I can come into a building and everybody is clothed and seated and in their right minds. Because as soon as we walk out there, they are no longer clothed or seated or in their right mind. Just go to Walmart. <laughs> Apparently, it's okay to shop in your pajamas now. And some folks, I'd be glad if they were in their pajamas. <laughs> but I'm so thankful to be saved, and I'm glad you're here. But I'll tell you what we need tonight. We need God's people with a renewed vision. We need God's people with revival. We need the Lord's people to have exactly what your theme is, to be spirit-filled. We're going to see some things tonight. We're going to go to two passages of Scripture. And the first place is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then we're going to run back to Joshua chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then Joshua chapter 3. If you're saved tonight, say amen. amen. If you remember where it was and when it was, and you remember what you used to be before you got saved, say amen. amen. I remember when it happened. I remember where I was. Listen, I was just a five-year-old boy when I got saved. Somebody said one time to me, he said, do you think people can really get saved when they're five? I said, I don't know about anybody else, but I know I did. I don't even know what I got for Christmas that year, but I remember I, and by the way, man, Christmas was the biggest thing in the world for a kid. I don't remember what I got for Christmas, but I remember when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I remember where I was. I remember coming into my daddy's room at night. I remember waking him up. Listen, parents, have you ever been sleeping and you can feel somebody staring at you? Huh? And you open your eyes and one of your kids is like right over the top of you? And you want to be really nurturing, you want to be very helpful because they've probably had a bad dream and you want to just love on them and say, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, so you, wouldn't, you just, in your mind as a parent, you think you're going to wake up and like, what is it, dear? You had a bad dream? Oh, come snuggle with dad, it's okay. No, but you wake up like, ah! you know, then your kid had a bad dream and a black eye, you know? That's what I did. I was hanging over my dad, five years old, and my dad did that very thing, whoa, what? And he grabbed hold of me. I said, Dad, 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 I need to get saved. He said, we'll talk about it in the morning. <laughs> and he rolled over. I said, Dad, I may not be here in the morning. He said, where are you going to go? <laughs> You're five. I said, what if I die tonight? And that's when Daddy knew I was ready. He rolled back over. He said, what if you die tonight? I said, Daddy, I'm going to go to hell. I need to be saved. I remember my daddy getting off that bed and slipping on that floor on his knees and opening that Bible. I still remember my mom's green and pink comforter. It was green and pink squares, like a quilt thing. And I remember, I remember I was holding on to that little comforter, praying and asking Jesus to come in my heart and save me. And can I tell you something? Listen carefully. Can I tell you something? He did it. <laughs> he, heard, he heard my cry. And he saved me. Thank God for that. Amen? What a joy to be saved. I struggled with that for a while after I got a little older. I heard a lot of messages about from the gutter to the pulpit and from prison to the pulpit and life of crime and all that kind of stuff to the pulpit. And I came to my dad one time. I said, Dad, I just, I don't know if I'm saved or not. You know, I was really young when I got saved. And he said, do you remember trusting Christ? Do you know what you did? And I told him what I did. I told him I remember that night. I remember trusting Jesus Christ. I remember it all. I said, but Dad, I just don't, I don't have the testimony that you have. I named a few other preachers that Dad had in. I said, I don't, I don't have the testimony he has. You know, when I got saved, I didn't give up drinking. Amen. When I, when, I, when I got saved, I didn't start going to church. I was, still, I was already going to church. And so my, my dad looked at me, and, man, I remember his eyes filled with tears. And he said, son, I wish I had your testimony. He said, I want you to get this straight. So I want you to get this straight. Look right here at me. He said, God saved your daddy out of a life of sin. He said, but God saved you from a life of sin. And he took me over there to the book of... He took me over there to the book of Timothy, and he said, Son, look right here. He said that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. 
They're able to make thee wise. He said, nowhere in that book will you ever find it said of Timothy that he was an old blasphemer and an old drunk and an old wicked man. He said, Paul had the testimony, I was murderous and a blasphemer and chiefest of sinners. But old Timothy knew that from a child, he knew the Holy Scriptures. Let me tell you something, moms and daddies, don't you ever feel, don't you ever feel that you're jipping your kids, that they're missing something by being in church. They're missing a lot by being in church. They're missing the old life of sin and the scars and the regrets. They're missing a lot by being in church. Thank God I missed a whole lot by being in church. But man, I got a whole lot too. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look over here at verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now I do have to pause for just a moment and just tell you that what a wonderful story it is about the rock that followed them in the wilderness. But I got to just tell you about my, how my brain works. Growing up as a kid in the church and with my imagination, I, I, I always stop and think about that last guy in line. You know, you're the last guy in line. You're, you know, you're the tribe of Dan and you're bringing up the rear. So the cloud moves and here we go. You start walking and... You know, think about that. There's rocks just following you through the desert, you know. Poor guy in the back is like, all right, everybody through. All rocks through. Come on, move it, you know. Poor guy trying to get a good night's sleep. You sit the tent up. You lay down. You roll over. Whoa, you know. Roll the other way. But the Bible says that rock followed him. Can I tell you something? That rock was Christ. <laughs> hey, look at here. They had the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night above them, in front of them, and they had the rock behind them. You know, the Bible says that he goes before us, but he also comes behind us. <laughs> oh, listen, we have nothing to worry about tonight. Look at me. Look at the Bible, what the Bible says here in verse number 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. Who? Who? Those of us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Hey, we are those that God had in mind that we would be the saints upon whom the ends of the world are come. Can I tell you something tonight? We want to complain about the way the world is going and where it is. One of my men came to me the other day and he said, Preacher, what's the world coming to? I said, It's coming to Jesus. Amen. It's coming to Jesus. He made it. He formed it. And one of these days, very soon, he's going to come and take us out of here. And we're going to rise to be with him in the clouds. And there'll be an antichrist that will arise. And he'll deceive the nations with the power of Satan and the false prophet. And they will make wonders and signs. And the world will worship them. But listen to me very carefully. After seven years, there will be the thundering white hooves of that great steed of glory. And Jesus shall ride in on that great that great white horse upon his thigh will be written Lord of Lords and King of Kings in a vesture dipped with blood and out of his mouth shall come the sword. He will devour the Antichrist. He will overthrow his armies. The blood will flow to the horse's bridle. Jesus will walk that horse right into the eastern gates. Those eastern gates will bust open singing Hosanna to the King. He will walk his horse up to that old cobblestone roads of Jerusalem. He will dismount the steed and he will mount the throne of David and he will establish as his rule and reign and instantly the deserts will bloom and the flowers will grow and the waters will run clear and there will be no more pollution there will be no more problems and now children can play with the snakes and the scorpions the lion will lay down with the lamb and we will rule and reign with our Lord listen God's not finished with this world yet there's no such thing as global warming and disappearing ice and polar bears going extinct God's not done with this world for at least another thousand years what's the world coming to it's coming to Jesus and very soon every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says it's upon us that the ends of the world are come. He said everything that happened aforetime, everything that happened in the Old Testament, everything that happened to Israel was an example to us that it would admonish us and that it would exhort us and that it would teach us and that it would be our example. 
to those of us who are living at the end of the age. And I want to say, church, it is time for us to start paying attention to what happened in the Old Testament. What we ought to do is go back to the Old Testament and see what God did in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Listen to me. When we read the Old Testament, we ought to just shout our way through it. Just hallelujah our way through it. Because at the end of it, God was still on the throne and He still won. Look with me, if you will, in Joshua chapter 3. Look at Joshua chapter 3 tonight. I want to speak for these few moments on this subject. Our guide, our guide to the great unknown. Our guide to the great unknown. Our guide to the great unknown. Look at your Bible at Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua rose early in the morning. Well, my question is, what morning? What morning did he rise up early on? Just skip back very quickly to Joshua chapter 1. Just turn the page back to Joshua 1. The Bible says in verse 10, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals. For within how many days? Three days. He said, In three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. He said, now listen to me, you better prepare, because in three days we're going over. Then we get to chapter 3 and early in the morning. On what day? On what day? On the third day. Oh, listen to me. That third day always speaks of resurrection. It was on the third day. Listen to me in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you listen to me right now. It didn't evolve. It didn't come from a big bang. It didn't just get here. You are not molecules to man. You were not a single cell organism swimming around in some primordial stew. And eventually you popped out a couple of legs and a tail and some eyeballs. And you crawled up on dry land and climbed a tree and sprouted some fur and started swinging in the tree like a monkey. And then one day dropped your tail and walked into the university. That is not true. That didn't happen. God made you. God made me. In the beginning, God created. This world was made by him. This world is consists of him. And bless God, one of these days, this world will bow before him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says the earth was without void and form. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. But thank God, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. You see, your life was void and without form and darkness until the word of God was preached, that water of the word and the Holy Spirit of God moved upon it. And by hearing of the word, faith, The minute the Word of God was preached and the Spirit of God moved on it, all of a sudden that voice, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. That first day speaks of the incarnation of Christ when light, when the Word of God became form. The Word of God issued forth as light. John chapter 1 said, that John was not that light, but he bare witness of that light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But that Word issued forth and became light. That Word became flesh. The incarnation of Christ is day one. And God saw that it was good. Oh, listen to me. When God stood over that little manger and he looked upon that little baby that was born of a virgin those many years ago, God rejoiced and said, it was good. It was good. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, a body thou hast formed for me, a body thou hast prepared for me. The first Christmas gift ever given was a body for the Lord Jesus. Why? It was a body like our body, yet without sin. It was flesh. It was all flesh. He was all man. You better thank God that Jesus, God, came in the flesh, incarnation, that he became man that the Son of God became the Son of Man so the Son of Man can become the sons of God. Hallelujah for that. God said it was good. But then day two, and God said, let there be a firmament. Let it be in the midst. Every time you see that word midst, you can think of the cross. For Christ was always in the midst. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. Why is he in the midst? Because of the cross. Between the two thieves, Jesus hung in the midst. Day two speaks of the crucifixion, that he was in the midst. He separated the waters which were from above from the waters which were beneath. Jesus hung on Calvary, and the Bible says he was lifted up. And the Bible teaches that he was cut off from the land of the living. He was cut off from the waters which were beneath, speaking of this world. But the Bible also says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was cut off from the waters which were above 
And there Jesus hung in the midst between God and man, between heaven and earth. There he was in the great immense. He was that great firmament. And if you'll notice at the end of day two, God never said and it was good. But then came day three. And God said, let the dry land appear. And let it bring forth grass and fruit trees yielding fruit. Oh, thank God for that day when life came out of death and resurrection came and life sprung up on third day. That's resurrection day, brother. Always has been resurrection day. You get over there in your Bible, you get over there to the Gospels and Jesus went in the tomb three days and three nights. How many days and nights was Jonah in the be belly of the whale? Huh? Three. Isaac went with his father Abraham up the mountain of Moriah there to be sacrificed. How many days were they gone? Three days. He went up carrying the wood. He went up carrying the altar. He went up going up that mountain to be the sacrifice. But bless God, three days later, he came down very much alive. Listen to me right now. Jesus is alive and well. He came out of that tomb on the third day. And with that same power, with that same power, you are quickened by it. It lives in you. That power dwells in you by the same spirit that Jesus rose from Calvary. So he quickened your mortal bodies to live in him. On resurrection day, on the third day, Joshua says to the people, early in the morning, look what he says. And they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, and he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then shall ye remove from your place, and what, church? Go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. That's about a half mile. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Look at that. Look at that phrase right there. That ye may know the way by which ye must go. Everybody say that out loud with me. Read that little phrase out loud that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Well, why is it important that the Ark of the Covenant be about a half mile away and you're going to go after it? Why is that important? He said, don't come near it. Stay back from it. Keep your eye on it. Why? That ye may know the way. Why is that important? Look at the next phrase. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I want to speak for a few minutes on the guide to the great unknown. I love that little phrase, go after it. The children of Israel had been in the wilderness. Now I want you to hear something very carefully. Don't, don't miss this tonight, okay? Just by way of introduction, don't miss this. The children of Israel had come out of Egypt, and they came out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Egypt signifies the world. It's a type of Satan, Pharaoh there, of Satan, the God of this world, and enslaving them. And they came, they broke that bondage of slavery through the shed blood of the Lamb. And they went over that Red Sea on dry land. And they came into the wilderness. And in that wilderness, God brought them to that mount, and he gave him his law, and he gave him his word. And God made a covenant with the people. And there they were to go over to that land that God had prepared for them and they were to possess it. Now, here's what we think. We think that they were supposed to wander for 40 years. They were not supposed to wander for 40 years. They were supposed to go from Egypt and they were supposed to go into the promised land. And the promised land is not heaven. It is not heaven. Brother, if I get to heaven and there's a Jericho there and there are still battles and giants to fight, I'm going to be one depressed man. We see, when we get to heaven, we can sing... Now the battle's over, and we shall wear a crown. Amen. There are no more battles in heaven. The victory is won in heaven. No, listen to me. That speaks over there in the promised land. It speaks of the victorious Christian life. The Bible says that God causeth us always to triumph 
in Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I said? He causes us always to triumph. One of the things that burdens my heart, and I am stirred deeply in my soul, I am so concerned about the apathy and the lethargy and the deadness of the church today. We are hunkered down, and we're just waiting on Jesus to come rescue us from this bad experience that we're having. When the church is supposed to be on the move, and we're to be attacking and working and thriving and growing and preaching with vigor and power, yet we're waiting, we're hunkered waiting. And we're talking about how bad this is and this administration and this economy and this war and these migrate, these these folks folks that are migrating and and, uh, what are we going to do with all the world's problems? Listen to me very carefully. May I remind you that it was Nero who was on the throne when Paul said, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you hear what I said? We are more than conquerors. A conqueror is one who has to go in and win by battle. But more than a conqueror is one who has the victory and didn't have to battle. The church of today, I'm concerned about it. The church of today is sitting back and we're just waiting for Jesus to come and rescue us instead of occupying until he comes. The children of Israel were supposed to go in that land of victory. It's a land where walls were going to fall before them and giants were going to bow down before them. It was a land where God was going to drive them out. May I remind you that they, they, 40 years later, when they sent the spies into the land, may I remind you that it was Rahab the harlot that said, oh yeah, we know who you are. Your God opened the Red Sea. We've been waiting on you to get here. Our people are filled with terror about you. Listen, they were ready to open the gates and lay down their arms behind those fortified walls. God had already been there. God had already prepared the victory. God had already made a way. And they just chose to wander in the wilderness. They were out there complaining because they were eating this manna. See, we've over-romanticized manna. You know, we've written songs about, I'm feasting on the manna. I don't want manna. I want the new manna that he gives me there. Listen to me, the reason why they grumbled and complained when they're out there in Numbers chapter 11, they said, man, we want to go back to Egypt and have some flesh. They wanted steak and some fish and some leeks and garlics and melons because they were eating crackers. And the Bible says that these little crackers were on the dew and the Bible says they tasted like oil and honey. The name manna means what is it? That's what it means. That's what the name manna means. Am I right, preacher? It means, what is it? Have you ever, ladies, have you ever fixed a new meal, a casserole or something? You sit on the table and everybody went, what is it? I grew up in a house. Listen to me. I grew up in a house. I wasn't one of these spoiled kids today. I grew up in a home where my daddy grew up in the Depression. And my daddy knew if it's on the table, you eat it. Brussels sprouts and all. And if you said in my house... If you said, now listen to me, we didn't just get to come to the kitchen, tell mom what we wanted, snag it, go back to our room and play video games. Uh Uh-uh. We all sat at the table together and looked at each other in the face and we ate what mama fixed. By the way, can I just tell you something? That may seem unimportant, but if some of you would go home and try that, it would start revival in your home. Put the phone down. Put all, shut the TVs off and the radios off and everything else and just sit at the table and talk. Junior may twitch a little bit. He may, he, he, may, he may do some of this a little bit. He'll get over it. But if we ever say, well, my mom fixed something, we say, ooh, I don't like that. That just meant to dad, that's two scoops. <laughs> and you eat it all until it's gone. Amen? One time in my life, once, my mother put some manna on the table. And my dad went, what is it? (laughs) And my mom said, it's cream spinach. Let me tell you something. (laughs) Spinach ain't so hot by itself. But when you go pouring milk on it, we got some problems. I mean, I can understand. Put a little milk on some Captain Crunch. Come on now. Or some fruity pebbles or some cocoa puffs. But you go putting milk on spinach. You got too much time on your hand in that kitchen. Dad said, what is it? 
Mom said, cream spinach. Dad sat back and said, kids, you don't have to eat that. <laughs> I remember sitting at the table going, yes! We didn't see mom for a day or two. About the third day, we started seeing mom because the swelling started kind of going down in our eyes. You know, then we started seeing her. They said, they walked outside and they said, manna. They weren't going, manna. They were going, what is it? And the Bible said it tasted like oil and honey. You say, oh, that's not bad. Listen to me. It tasted like oil and honey. It wasn't oil. And it wasn't honey. It just tasted like oil and honey. It was not meant to satisfy. It was meant to sustain. It was meant to get them through from Egypt to victory. It was that time as a growing Christian, as a baby Christian, when you come and you eat the milk of the word and God gives you some manna and he sustains you until you learn how to walk and get victory and, and you can learn to take down some giants and eat some honey and milk and real things over there in Canaan and a new diet over there. It wasn't supposed to last them for 40 years and they were complaining because they were living on something that was just sustaining but not satisfying. Let me tell you why our churches are full of complainers and whiners and crybabies and we're lusting after this world and we cannot get enough of the world and our kids want to leave and go back to the world and we want Egypt more than we want God because we've been telling them that the Christian life is manna. We've been telling them that it's just an artificial substitute. It just tastes like Jesus. It just kind of looks like Jesus. It just resembles Jesus. But is it really Jesus? That's why Jesus said, your fathers ate bread, ate manna in the wilderness, but I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Amen. Reason why we have a bunch of our kids leaving the back doors of our churches and running back to Egypt because they're hungry for the flesh and they're hungry for the fish and they're hungry for the leeks and the garlics and the manna because we've been feeding them some substitute, some watered down. It tastes like Christianity. It kind of resembles Christianity. It has the flavor of Christianity, but it's not the real thing. It'll just sustain you, but it won't satisfy you. So God was preparing his people to enter in, and he said, you're no longer going to eat that manna. You're going to prepare some victuals. And he said, you're going to go to another way. You've never passed this way here before. May I just say to the church right now, listen to me. These people were camped out on Jordan. They were on the brink of blessing. And they were going to go into a land they had never been before. They were on the brink of of blessing. Are you listening to me right now? Do you understand that we are on the brink of eternity? We are right here on the edge of eternity. We are the people of God who have, at this time in history are on the brink of it. This world is having the birth pains. We're seeing the tumult before Jesus comes. We're on the very cusp of the return of Christ. In any minute, he could break the eastern sky. Any minute, we could see Jesus' face. It may be tonight. We may be walking on clouds before the evening's over. We may be beholding him in his glory before the night it's over. Before the sun comes up in the morning, we may be in a land where there is no more sun and there is no more moon. We're right here on the crisp. We're right here on the very edge of blessing. And he said, now listen to me, we're going to make a change here. You're going to go into a land you've never been before. We're going to go into some things as a church we've never been before. We're going to go into some things in our culture and in our country. We're going to go away we've never been before. We're right here on the brink of great victory, great opportunities, mighty things, great walls are coming down. See, some of you are discouraged because you're looking at the giants. You're discouraged because you're seeing the problems. It's homosexual marriage. It's the economy. It's a horrible government. It's socialism. It's immigrants. It's all this kind of problems all over the world. Terrorism and Islam. And what are we going to do? Get your eyes off the walls. Get your eyes off the giants. And get your eyes on Jesus. He said, there's going to be a great change. We're going to a new place. We're going to go to new territory. So he said, you're going to change from manna. You're going to start eating some great corn and wine and the bread of the new land. He said, so what I want you to do is take the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to put it out ahead of you. And he said, and I want you to go after it. When it moves, you move. I see, the Ark of the Covenant was only two foot by two foot by four foot. And it was covered in gold. And it had two seraphims, two angels whose wings over. And that gold plate right there is where the high priest once a year would sprinkle the blood. And God in his Shekinah glory would sit there in the mercy seat. You say, what does all that mean? The Old Testament ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. It was the presence of God among the people of God. And because, now listen to me, church. We're going to be done in a minute. But listen to me. 
because they were about to go into a new land. And they were going to go do things they'd never done before. And they were going into a way they've never been before. Just like our churches today, we're about to see some things we've never seen before. We're going to have to experience some things we've never experienced them before. But there's great victory over here. It's not, it's not defeatism. It's victory. We're going in. Listen to me. We're not facing this world as defeatists. We're facing this world as conquerors. See, some of you don't believe that. And he said, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take Christ, who for these 40 years has been in your midst. 40 years you've encamped around him. 40 years you've had him in your possession. Listen to me. Nothing was changing here with the ark except its position. It was no longer going to be in the midst. It was going to be out front. No longer were they going to just be bearing the ark. It was going to be leading them. Listen to me, as we go into this great unknown and we face what we're about to face in this world, there needs to be a, a change with Jesus in your life. And the change is not possession. If you have him, you possess him. What needs to change is his position. See, you've had him all this while. We've been wandering in carnality. Let's just be honest, church. We've been wandering just picking up the pieces of manna. We've been wandering around just tasting a little foretaste of heaven and a little foretaste of victory. We've just been snacking on the hors d'oeuvres. We've just been having a little appetizer. But many of us have never gone in to possess our possessions. We've never walked in victory. We've never seen great walls come down. We've not seen the giants fall. We've not seen God chase them out with hornets. We've not seen God, oh God, give me a generation of Christians that'll get tired of hearing the stories of yesterday and the revivals of yesteryear and may we start praying down fresh anointing and fresh power and see new victories and new miracles and our churches busting at the seams and conversions and wicked becoming righteous may we see great power again God give us some churches where we no longer just possess Christ but we truly follow him see what happens is is the resident needs to become the president you know what I hope rings in your ears tomorrow morning when you get up to pray? I hope this rings in your ears. When you get up in the morning, you say, Lord, I want it to ring in your ears. Why call ye me Lord and do not the things that I say? Oh, Lord, why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? You've just been possessing me. And now I want you to follow me. I want your eyes on the ark. He's about to take us to the great unknown. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Now listen to me very carefully. If we're going to follow our guide to the great unknown, if we're going to see victory in a wicked world, I'm talking about some of you young people. Son, you need to believe that God can do it again. You need to believe, you need to get it deep down in your heart that God is as mighty as he's ever been, that God is as great as he's always been, that God has the power that he's always had, and God wants to do great things. He wants to work wonders among his people. And if we're going to see God do it, there's got to be a position change of Christ. He's got to be out front, and then we've got to go after him. Let me show you just very quickly this. Number one, if God is going to, lead us into these uncharted territories. Number one, we need to understand that he will guide us in uncharted places. You're going into a place you've never been here before, but if you'll watch him, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. Listen to me very carefully, church. There is a way by which, not just that we can go or should go, there is a way that we must go. And the only way that we're going to know where our churches must go is if Jesus is out in front and we are following when he moves. I read a story about an old ship. I mean, it was an old crickety ship. It was out at sea and it always in these stories, it was late at night and it was in a terrible storm. Isn't that the way it always is? And a wealthy man on the ship was afraid and he ran down to the captain's quarters and he beat on the door. And, he's, and the, he told him who it was. He's a prominent passenger. And the captain opened up the door. And, uh, man, they're just in this major storm. And he said, Captain, I want to know. Are we going to make it? The captain scratched his head and said, Well, I'll tell you, sir. This is an old rickety vessel. He said it was almost coming apart at the seams when we were in the harbor. It was barely seaworthy in the harbor, let alone in a storm. He said, but are we going to make it? He said, well, I'll tell you, those boilers downstairs are mighty thin. 
He said they were very, 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 very poorly built. They're not in good shape, even when we were in port. But now we've got the hottest fires we've ever had in them. We're putting the steam to them like we've never put steam to them now. He said, I don't know. And the man said, grab the captain and said, what does it all mean? He said, well, it's a rickety old ship. It means we may go down. He said, well, what about the boilers? He said, well, they're real thin and their fire's real hot, so we may go up. He said, well, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to go on. Look at me, church. Death may come. We may die before the sun comes up in the morning. You may be healthy and die in an accident. We don't know. We may go down. But Jesus may come tonight and we may go up. But regardless, bless God, we're moving on. We may go down. We may go up. But bless God, the church needs to just point the stern into the storm and ride the waves and know that Jesus is at the helm. And whether we go down or whether we go up, bless God, we're going on. There's no turning back. He's going to guide us through uncharted places. He's going to take us through the storm. We have a captain that knows the sea. He's the maker of the wind. He's the master of the waves. He can calm them, and he can steal them, and he can steer the ship right through them. He knows how to get his people where he wants them to go. Can I tell you something? There's three things about that you don't have to know. You don't have to know. Listen, if he's going to guide you and guide us through uncharted places, you don't have to know where. I don't have to know where God's going to lead me and where God's going to take us. It doesn't matter where, as long as my eyes are on him. The ark is out front, and as long as I'm looking at the ark and as long as I'm looking at Jesus, I'm going to know where I must go. It doesn't matter where we're going. One day Jesus showed up there in the Old Testament, and he said to Abraham, Listen, I'm the Lord God Almighty. I want you to get up, leave your family, leave your kindred, leave your mama, leave your daddy, leave your house, leave everything you got, and follow me. And Abraham, Abraham probably wanted to ask, where are we going? But the Lord just said, I'm going to take you to a city that I built. Abraham followed the Lord for all those years and never did make it to that city till he died. Look at me right now. You don't need to know where. You say, where's all this going to go? doesn't matter. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Well, where are we going with it? It doesn't matter where we're going. Huh. Let me tell you something. One of the greatest graces that God has ever given the church is that you don't know your future. Look, I'm glad I don't know the future. Could you imagine if God opened the door and let you see the future? Some of you might be jumping up and down and say, yes, I didn't even know I had a rich uncle that was going to die. Woo! We're in the money. But the guy next to you is bawling. I'm going to get cancer. Yeah, but I'm going to be rich. Yeah, but I'm going to die. Listen, one of the greatest graces that God ever gave us is that we don't know what the future holds. We just got to keep our eye on the ark. Let me tell you something, something else you don't have to know. You don't have to know where, but you also don't have to know when. When's this going to happen? When's it all going to take place? When, when are we going to get where we're going? Like my kids in the back seat, when are we going to get there? We're going to get there when Jesus gets there. He's never been late. He's never been early. He's always been right on time. And whenever Jesus shows up, it's always the right time. Listen to me. He was four days late, they thought, to Lazarus. Lazarus was dead and stunk. But let me tell you something. When Jesus came in, he was right on time because Lazarus got up to meet him. You don't have to know when God's going to move in your life. You just follow him. And I'll tell you something else, church, and you better listen very carefully here. You don't need to know why. I really believe, Brother Norris, I believe that many Christians are stuck in the wilderness wandering out because we want God to explain to us what we're doing out here and where he's going and why it happened and why did we have to leave Egypt and why did this have to happen and why did that have to happen and why this burden? Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. Look at me. God doesn't owe us an explanation. And if he gave you one, you wouldn't understand it anyway. I don't know why God's going to do what he's going to do. I don't have to know why he's chosen this rapture and why he's chosen the tribulation and why he's chosen the millennium. I don't know. He's God. I can't understand it. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Look what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 3. Look at this. Look at this. Look at verse 5. Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. I mean, to wonder means to stand in awe. I don't want God to do things that I can understand. I want God to do things that only he can understand. I want God to do things where I just stand back and say, wow. 
I remember years ago, our church was busting at the seams in Colorado, and we, we had already went through four buildings. We were blowing the seams out of the building we were on, and I remember my dad taking us kids up, and we would, there was a little piece of property for sale, three and a half acres, and we went up there, and I remember dad taking his shoes off and walking that property and just claiming that property for the Lord. Oh, God, give us this property. We prayed. We knelt down at the, at the real estate sign, three acres for sale. We all, dad said, put your hands on the sign. Put your hands on the sign. We ought to put our hands on the sign. Put our hands on the sign. We prayed that God would give us those three acres. I won't go through the whole long story, but they were having a prayer meeting at church one night, and a man came in and told my dad, said, listen, this man right here is a real estate man. His name's Roy Pring. He owns a bunch of property here in the city. You might want to go talk to him. Dad said, yeah, yeah, I'll go talk to him. We're praying about those three and a half acres over there. Let's pray that God will give us those three and a half acres. Roy Pring had nothing to do with those three and a half acres. We're praying for those three and a half acres. Let's just believe God on that. Well, the next week, they're having a prayer meeting. The man walked in and said, hey, pastor, did you see the morning paper? He said, listen, that man that I told you to go see, Roy Pring, he was in a bad train car accident. He was driving across the tracks. A train hit him. He's in the ICU right now. He said, you probably ought to go see him. My dad ran up to the hospital. Dad walked in the ICU room. Doctors and nurses working on him. Dad stood over the bed and said, Mr. Pring, don't, don't, don't talk. He said, my name is Pastor Miller. I've heard about your accident. My dad stood in that room and talked to him about Jesus. And there in that room, Roy Pring took my daddy by the hand. And he took, more important, he took Jesus in his heart. Dad went back to see him day after day after day to encourage him and pray with him. And one day, Dad walked into his hospital room and the bed was made. My dad asked the nurse, said, hey, where's Mr. Pring? I said, oh, he went home. My dad said, you let him go home? She said, aren't you the pastor? I thought you'd be happy about that. And the Holy Spirit said, you know where he lives. Dad drove over to his house. Rang the doorbell, little speaker on the side of the door said, who is it? My dad, my dad an old Montana cowboy, got down there like that. Said, it's Pastor Miller. He still does that at drive throughs to this day. I don't know why. I said, Dad, they, you don't have to actually yell from here into the building. They have a speaker. Dad pulls up there like, welcome to McDonald's, man. Take your order. Dad's like, yeah, we'll have a, a number one. And this is, how, this is how he does it. He said, we'll have a number one. He's like, Jerry, what are you having? My mom said, I'll have a number one. Okay, uh, two number ones. Then I say, what, what are you? And I'll say, I'll have a, I'll have a, I'll just have a cheeseburger meal. Okay, two number ones and a cheeseburger meal. We get up there and the bill's like $75. It's like, how can it be $75? I ordered three meals. They said, no, you had seven number ones. And Dad got down there and said, it's Pastor Miller. And Roy Prank said, come in. The door opened right up. Dad walked in, door closed behind him. Voice came over an intercom, said there's a spiral staircase to the right. There's an elevator to the left. Choose one. Dad got in the elevator. Door closed. Music started playing. Went up to the second floor. Got off. Voice said, turn left. Come down here to the... Dad walked into a beautiful den overlooking Colorado Springs and Pikes Peak over there. Roy Pring sitting there said, what can I do for you, Pastor? And he said, I came to just check on and see how you were. I want to talk to you about buying some property. And he goes, oh, where would you like to have the property? He said, well, we're looking to build a church. He said, where would you like to build your church? Dad's thinking, he said, we're thinking about this into town up here. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, why don't you, uh, why don't you walk out of my house and and, and walk up to the top of the hill, and I'll meet you in a little bit. My dad and my mom walked up to the top of the house, uh, the top of the hill. He came up a little while later in his Lincoln Continental and got out and said, what do you think? And dad said, well, it's a beautiful view. He goes, no, what do you think about this property? Dad said, this property that we're on? He said, yeah. he said this is the highest point in the city of Colorado Springs. He says, the best piece of property I have is 20 acres. He said, I talked it over with my wife, Charlotte. We decided we're going to give it to you. Here we were down there walking over three and a half acres <laughs> at the bottom of the hill. Oh, God, give us three and a half acres. And God said, tomorrow, I'm going to do wonders among you. I'm going to do some things you can't explain, some things there's no power that you have to accomplish. Them. Let God do some wonders in our life. Get the ark out in front of us and say, you follow it. Go after it. Let God do some wonders. He knows how to lead us to uncharted places. Let me say quickly, he will grant you the unfading promises. Not only, will he, not only will he guide you in uncharted places, but he'll grant you the unfading promises. Do you know that the Bible says this? Everybody look at your Bible now. Joshua chapter 3. Look at, verse number, look at verse number 3. And they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. Now would you do something right there? Look at that word. The ark of the what church? What's a covenant? It's a promise. It's a contractual agreement that cannot be broken. That ark was an ark of promise. Now, you know what some of us think? 
Some of us think, well, sure, those promises are for those people back there. But God had just finished telling Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. See, some of us think that those Old Testament people and the people in the Bible, they breathed different air than we breathe. They did different things. That we, they, were, they were made of different stuff. Listen to me. Elijah was a man of like passions as you are. And if God could do it for them, he can do it for us. God's given us great promises, great and exceeding precious promises. And those promises are still with us. Jesus is our ark of the covenant. He is, listen to me, he made a covenant with us in the book of John. He said, this is now the blood, the blood of the New Testament, the cup of my covenant. Listen to me, that's why I can't understand people who don't believe in eternal security. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't make a deal with me, he made a covenant with me. And the covenant was in his blood. And if his blood is everlasting, then the covenant's everlasting. And he's faithful to his word. And listen to me, I'm not going to heaven on some whim and some prayer. I'm not going to heaven because I had enough faith. Listen to me, we're not looking at our faith. We're not looking at our own works. We're looking at the ark of the covenant. Sometimes the devil will do tricks on you. He'll tell you, do you believe enough? Listen, I'm not having faith in my faith. He's done that to me before. I've been praying, and the devil say, well, I don't think you're believing well enough. You just, you know, and I've got to work up some kind of belief. You know, oh, boy, if I just believe real hard. Listen to me, I'm not saved, and I don't get to claim those promises because of how I believe. I'm saved, and I claim the promises because of whom I have believed in. I know whom I have believed in. He is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I have a covenant. You know, the Bible says that when we get saved, Jesus comes to move in us. We are partakers of the divine, of the divine nature. Which means very carefully, listen, when you got saved, you switched over from the old man to the new man. And for the new man, it is unnatural to sin. We ought not to be living in sin. But our problem is this. Our problem is we won't take the promises of God's word by faith and just believe them. Look at right here. See this jacket? Now watch this very carefully. Jacket, raise your arms. Jacket, I want you to clap your hands. Jacket, I want you to stand upright and wave your Bible. What's well, a disobedient jacket? Now watch this. Hey, Jacket, I want you to raise your hands. Hey, Jacket, I want you to clap your hands. Hey, Jacket, I want you to wave your Bible in the air. You say, that's not the jacket, that's you. Oh, I'm glad you're getting it. It's not the jacket, it's me in the jacket. You know why some of us aren't having victory tonight? Because it is us and it's, we're un, we are inanimate objects. We are dead in our flesh but it is Christ in me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ living in me in the life which I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. We're to put on Christ and let him move. Let him have his being. He said, I want to guide you and I want to grant you these unfading promises. The same promises that were to the Apostle Paul, those same promises are for me. You say, yeah, but I'm no Paul. Yeah, guess what? But Paul's no Dean. I am no Paul. I'm Dean. And bless God, Jesus is the same Jesus to Paul and Dean. Let me give you the last thing. Not only will he guide you through the uncharted places, but he will grant you the unfading promises. I'm talking about when we're, standing on the, when we're standing on the banks of Jordan about to go in to a place we've never been to before church. Do you understand what we're facing today? The formidable walls of, of Jericho, the great giants of atheism and evolution and violence and a culture that is sold on sin and hypersexualized. That's what we're facing. But the Ark of the Covenant is out in front. But Christ goes before us. And the Bible says here that he will guard you with unfailing power. Oh, I want to shout for just a minute. Would you just, would you just be kind enough to listen for another minute? Look in Joshua chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. 
And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God, oh, I love that, that the living God, that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Gerizzites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Termites. Amen. <laughs> Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth. Notice that of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Look at those words, into Jordan. Look at verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. He repeats it again several times. He is the living God. He is the God of all the earth. He is the living God. He is the Lord. He rules the whole earth. He's the liberating God. He knows how to lead his people to victory. He said right here, he said when their soles of their feet touch the water, the waters of, that, of, of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above and they shall stand up upon and heap. Look over at, the, at your verse in verse 16 that the waters which come down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam. Now, I don't believe that was in there by mistake, do you? Now, who is the Ark of the Covenant? Who is that? Who is that? Say it out loud. Who is the Ark of the Covenant? That's Jesus Christ. He's out in front of us. He's going to go before us. When He goes, we go after it. Where he goes, we follow. The Bible says when that Ark of the Covenant goes into Jordan, as soon as the soles of their feet touch in that Jordan, the waters will stand up from a heap all the way back to the city of Adam. You see, now Jordan means the descender. It flows from Mount Hermon down to the Dead Sea. It's the descender. It comes down from the mountain and it winds its way through the valley and it empties into the Dead Sea. Jordan, the name Dan, where it comes from, means judgment. It is the descender into judgment. It is the river of death. It is the river of judgment. Are you listening to me? And when Christ went into those muddy waters of Jordan and he faced death. That river of judgment, he faced it for every man when he stood there in that river. The waters piled up in a heap from the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of Adam. The Bible says in the New Testament that from Adam unto Christ, death reigned. But from Christ on, it is life everlasting and it is life anew. Listen to me right now. If Jesus could wade into the muddy waters of death and he could bear the judgment of God and there he can stand and heap up death and pile up destruction and pile up the judgment of God and yea, from Jesus on down, the river is dry. The water is gone. There is no more death. There is no more judgment. There is no more destruction. It's a way of victory. It's a passage to glory land. It's a passage to Canaan, to milk and honey. Listen to me. All we have to do is wade on in. You see, Jesus already took it. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He conquered hell. He conquered sin. And then he said here, I'm the way. The truth, the life. Go to victory. It's already yours. Listen to me, church, right now. Look at me. You see, they thought they had Jesus. He was beaten. He was dead. He was in the tomb. They thought they had him. <laughs> they thought they had him. But three days later, the ground began to shake. And the stone rolled back, and Jesus came out alive and well. And he came out not as a victim. He, listen to me carefully. He didn't go to hell as a victim. He went to hell as victor. 
And he took the keys of sin and death. He took the chains of hell. And he came out victorious over the sin and grave. And Jesus stood in victory in a glorified body. And he gave that victory to me. And he gave that victory to you. And he tells the church, listen to me, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to tell you something. We win. We win. We win. We win. We win. At the end of the day, at the last trump of God, when every grave burst open, your loved ones that are gone, your tears, that you've wept, the sorrow that you've borne, the heartache that faces us, the battles that lie ahead. Bless God when it's all said and done. We win. This church ought to fall on its face tonight and say, oh God, forgive us for wandering in the wilderness. Forgive us for just eating on the manna. Forgive us for just following you and possessing Christ. Oh dear Jesus, take the lead. Get out in front. Cross that river. Take us on to victory. May we be more than conquerors. I refuse to be a wilderness wanderer. I'm going to be a Canaan conqueror. Jesus already won. I want you to know something. What lies ahead of us is unknown. We've never been this way heretofore. But Jesus knows the way that we must go. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I will follow on. How about that old hymn? The footprints of Jesus. That make the pathway glow. I will follow the steps of Jesus where ere they go. Are you following Christ tonight? Some of you need to go home and find the OFF switch on the remote and aim it right at the TV and just pick up the Bible and say, okay, Jesus. You've been the resident too long. Now you're the president. Grant me those promises. Guide me to those places. And give me that protection. And give me victory. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord Jesus, Lord, I thank you tonight for the patience of thy people. Lord, we're so consumed with time that many are unconcerned with eternity. I pray tonight that you would place eternity in our heart. Lord Jesus, may you become the Lord. May you become the master, the president. Lord, may we follow you. May this church know what it is to be spirit-filled. May we see the walls of sin come tumbling down. May we be unafraid of this culture. May we be unafraid of the giants that are ahead of us. May we see them already as defeated foes at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Father, forgive us for our faithlessness. Forgive us for our lack of courage and belief in thy word. Stir us to action. Lord, I pray that you'll grant us the promises, the power, the protection. Our heads are bowed, church, our eyes are closed. Who's here tonight?